All this week on To The Point, the ABC 10 weather impact team is investigating California's power grid and how it's balancing costs, climate and demand. Demand for electricity is expected to skyrocket. Last night, we explained California's history and in power innovation. Tonight, meteorologist Brendan Minchev shows us how the state is growing and its power grid. Yeah, California's grid in 2025 is better than it was even five years ago. Despite the numerous challenges it faces, uh, includes increasing electrification to a more volatile climate. But getting here was not easy. There have been big successes and costly mistakes. In 2000 and 2001, blackouts rocked California. There's a number of investigations ongoing. It's disgusting to see that the utility companies hadn't planned for it. Setting the stage for more change in the state's power struggle. The California energy crisis is still debated to this day what happened. A key enabler of the energy crisis were, were actions of the California legislature. Andy Campbell is the executive director of the Energy Institute at Haas at UC Berkeley. He works with a dozen energy and environmental economists researching the energy of the future, which can require examining the past. Laws were passed in the mid 1990s. There was sort of a desire at that time to try to reform the way the energy business was structured. There were several large vertically integrated utilities. The same company owned all the power plants, they owned all the transmission lines, they owned all the distribution lines. There was sort of a desire to see if there's a different way of doing things. Campbell says a major problem was the legislature required buyers of electricity to buy all of their electricity in a real-time basis. Enron was not the only one, but Enron was the biggest one to manipulate the market. They'd basically tell the grid operator, oh, I'm sorry, my power plant's broken. There's a problem with the power plant. It's down. Prices would spike. Enron had some other power plants. They're now selling energy at those very high prices. That caused supply and demand issues. When demand outpaces supply, the power grid becomes strained, and this can result in major outages. During the California energy crisis, there were more than two dozen blackouts. Some of the state's biggest investor-owned utilities, such as PG&E, went bankrupt. The state's legislature passed several emergency bills with the primary goal of stabilizing the grid, and California began taking more active roles in planning new power generation and transmission lines. The majority of California's power grid is managed right here in Folsom at the California Independent System Operator, or CAISO. Our job is to keep the lights on. I like to sometimes say that we're sort of a combination of a control tower operator and the NASDAQ, and that is that we have the responsibility for overseeing the flow of electricity across the high voltage transmission system in California and making sure that there's a constant balance of supply and demand. And we're constantly taking bids for supply and demand from market participants and balancing the system at the lowest possible cost, both within the state of California. And we actually also administer a market that covers about 80% of the Western United States. Elliot Mainzer, the president and CEO of CAISO, says that includes most of Arizona, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. All of this requires a lot of coordination a lot of collaboration and a lot of synchronization. California is sitting on a very healthy, pretty balanced portfolio. And I think part of our challenge in the years ahead is to continue to work with our energy planners to make sure that we have that portfolio that gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner over the years. There's a real strong partnership between us and the California ISO. A big player in California's energy portfolio is Pacific Gas and Electric. PG&E is one of the state's and the country's largest utility companies. We partner very closely together around where are our major load growths going to occur? And then we work together to say, well, which of these assets need to then be built out to accommodate that load? Over the next 20 years, PG&E is forecasting an increase of 70%. Quinn Nakayama is PG&E's Senior Director of Grid Innovation, Research, and Development. He's at the forefront of grid technology and knows how important meeting 21st century demand is. As all these industries continue to develop and rise, and especially with data centers which have significant amounts of power draw with things like AI and artificial intelligence now becoming a real big thing here in California. We can't get away from the build, but where we want to do innovation is in areas where maybe we don't need to build as much. I'm going to give you an example through cars and freeways. You have the 80 freeway and the 50 freeway to be able to take people from the outer areas into Sacramento. Well, maybe too many people are driving on the 80 freeway and not enough people are driving on the 50 freeway. 
and now you're needing to build out new infrastructure for the 80 to accommodate all these new people. But if I'm able to take those cars and push them to the 50 freeway, now I can share the load between these freeways and still feed all of Sacramento their driving needs to be able to help grow Sacramento area while at the same time not having to build another freeway. Well, we're doing the same thing here in our substations. Nakayama says it's not all just about upgrades. Being smarter about how the grid distributes power is part of it too. When the air conditioning is running, maybe I don't want to charge my car as fast. And if we can figure out how to modulate this type of stuff so it doesn't all need to suck up as much energy all at the same time, all the time, maybe we can create an environment where we'll be willing to work in that energy ecosystem and then I don't have to do those upgrades. That doesn't have to appear on your bill and everybody saves money. We've done a lot of work to coordinate and anticipate issues and we've really been able to ride through some pretty hot events here in California without having to call in flex alerts. Flex alerts were created and first issued in California during the 2000 and 2001 energy crisis. They are a measure of last resort, calling on Californians to conserve power to avoid rolling blackouts as demand outpaces supply. It makes a big difference if consumers in relatively large numbers take just those modest steps to flex their demand for a few hours. Particularly that four to nine period is the time of day when demand can still be very high. And of course, as the sun starts to set and our solar energy resources start to reduce the amount of power, that can become a strained period of the grid. California hasn't had a flex alert issued since September 2022, when much of the state saw all-time record heat but no blackouts, thanks in part to more battery storage. Back in 2020, we only had about 200 megawatts of batteries on our grid. In the last four or five years, we've now got almost 13,000 megawatts of batteries on our system. And by connecting to other states in the West, Kaiso can send power from typically cooler states like Idaho or Washington to California during the summer to meet increased demand. During the winter, California can send excess power up north. We have a grid that's bigger than the weather. We have huge amount of transmission that connects up to the hydro resources of the Pacific Northwest. We've got transmission resources that go out into the desert southwest, all the way out into the Intermountain West. As a matter of fact, we're also engaged in the construction of some big new transmission lines. It's all part of meeting California's clean energy goal. We are continually looking for new technologies and new energy procurements to get us to a net zero energy system by 2045. Two things. One, I do not envy their jobs. This seems like one of the most stressful jobs ever. Two, I'm actually proud. I'm a good, I feel like I'm a good steward of my power. Like I'm always turning off the lights, yeah. not running too much at one time. So that was very helpful, just those reminders, because we've all seen those flex alerts, you know? Yeah, and, and that's part of it, is these flex alerts have really helped us to ride through some of these really uh, big heat events, being bigger, uh, having a grid bigger than the weather is part of it too. That's when we can maybe call on Arizona or Utah or someone else maybe up north to send us some power on these really hot days. But uh, we're in a lot better shape. I said that before the story too because we're putting batteries on the grid. So it's not just we're only generating power when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, but we can store that power and use it when it's needed in these high demand times. All right, Brendan, thank you for bringing us this story. And I also want to mention that we will have more of California's power struggle coming up tomorrow night right here on To The Point. Rob Karlmark shows us how solar, wind, and hydropower are driving toward its carbon-free energy goals. You can also stream this series right now on the ABC10 Plus TV streaming app.